Welcome to our series of lectures entitled, The Quest for Spiritual Pathways. Tonight's talk is entitled, The Etherization of the Blood. As in previous talks, we oftentimes give you the notes from the talk, either in a PDF copy of our books that might be the reference point for these talks, or in other fashions that you can find out as you are looking at the video. Now, I want to have an explanatory note to begin with. The Gospel of Sophia. When Tyla and I created the Gospel of Sophia and she asked me to help her, as she worked on the first part, I worked on the second part. There's three volumes. Tonight's talk will be basically based upon the second volume of the Gospel of Sophia, entitled A Modern Path of Initiation. Now, from the beginning, Tyla was insistent that if we were going to write about Sophia, it had to be applicable. It had to be absolutely something that you can put into practice the very day that you read it. It had to be something that empowered people. It had to be something that was real, down to earth. And so I said to her, through all of my training and experience in comparative religions, I can write a description of what is talked about in volume one. In volume one is a description. It, well, it, first off, it describes the divine feminine trinity. But secondly, it gives you an entire cosmology, which we pointed out in the first talk that we did on transhumanism, that without a cosmology, you really don't know where you have been, where you are, or where you're going. By the time you finish reading volume one of the Gospel of Sophia, it will definitely give you an entire cosmology. The second volume will explain the same thing, but it will explain it from a different point of view, from the point of view of how do you apply this, and from the point of view of somewhat more of a mechanistic or a mechanical way to look at the very physical things that are happening that are part of the process described in the first volume of Gospel of Sophia, which can be called ascension. Now you can call it whatever you'd like, but in general, initiation is a process of ascension. It's basically replicating what we saw Jesus Christ do with his transfiguration, his resurrection and ascension. Or what we saw the Catholic Church would say, Mary went through when she was assumed into heaven. All of us have the chance, as we pointed out in the very first lecture, which was entitled transhumanism, to either choose to become something beyond a human, an angel perhaps, or some other type of deity or being that is higher than us as a human, or we do have the opportunity to descend instead of ascend. When that happens, we basically go backwards in evolution. Now, to ha understand a cosmology in relationship to ascension and descension, it was necessary to look at all the different secret teachings from Rudolf Steiner, from Anthroposophy, from Theosophy, from the different yogas, from the different Matrayana and Vajrayana, Tantrayanic practices, as well as what Rudolf Steiner has revealed is this new form of understanding an old and ancient process. And if you wanted to find some information on it, you could look in Carl Koenig's book called Earth and Man. But the best place to find the fullest expose that I know is in volume two of Gospel of Sophia, A Modern Path of Initiation. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. In the last talk, we showed the absolute importance of the ethers as we addressed the book, The Eternal Ethers, A Theory of Everything. And we made it very clear that if you don't understand the ethers, you really cannot understand initiation and spiritual development because it is when the human being begins to separate their consciousness from the etheric body that initiation begins. As we said from the beginning, we need to understand certain basic cosmological facts. And tonight I'm going to repeat some of them so we have a foundation again to build upon. The human being is first off physical, we know that, but there's a life body that builds up that physical body that is very little understood by science. We pointed out that it's actually a body of levity, a body that is ectropy instead of entropy. And that body is called the life body or the etheric body. And we described last time about the components of that etheric body, very complicated material that you only find at the very heart 
of the teachings of the ancient traditional teachings as well as modern teachings. As a matter of fact, the bottom line here is that the modern scientists call this process of ascension where we deposit certain minerals in the brain, biomineralization. And we're going to describe in great detail the way that modern science links up to the images, the archetypes, the living imaginations that the ancients gave us to describe this very process of ascension in the human body. And now, with science, literally every single day that I research it, I find further and further advancements in science to show that what Rudolf Steiner elaborated on and carried forward from the ancients, the very teachings that some would confuse with the teachings of, say, Kundalini Yoga, that there are many types of yoga. And if you do not do the beginning practices, which have to do with morality training, the final practices will do you no good. As a matter of fact, there's four stages that you have in any of these practices, and they're outlined quite exactly in the second volume of Gospel Sophia, called Sutrayana is the first stage. Sutrayana starts with the heart. It starts with the pure virgin heart. And when you are practicing morality and you're studying the sutras, what, no matter what sutra it is, the sutras all point at morality development, and that starts in the heart. And that's called, in fact, Sutrayana. The next stage, because we have pointed out before that we really start spiritual development now in our time in the heart. And we'll elaborate further on that in a minute. But as we go to the second stage, you go to what is called mantrayana. In other words, you're using your voice to say beautiful mantras or sing beautiful songs or to say beautiful words or to take the Heart Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, the prayer of the Our Father, take whatever prayer or whatever meditation or insight or concentration tool that you use, but if you vocalize it, it will become 10 times more powerful. So you start with Sutrayana, morality development, then you go to Mantrayana, then you go to the next chakra, the brow chakra, this is the heart chakra, the throat chakra, the brow chakra, and the crown chakra, the four we're gonna be talking about almost exclusively tonight. But when you go from Sutrayana to Mantrayana to Vajrayana, then you visualize yourself as a deity. And it doesn't matter what deity, whether it's Mother Mary or whether it's Jesus Christ or whether it's um, Manjushri, the being of wisdom, or Vajrayogini or Avalokiteshvara that we're going to be talking about here in a moment. You imagine yourself to be exactly like them and you say the very words that their prayers give us that associate us with those beings. So you start off with a pure heart, you use pure sound and pure words, mantras, you use pure visualizations, and then in the end we can reach the crown chakra. And in the crown chakra, we can then find what is called tantrayana. And tantrayana means that we use spiritual tools of all sorts so that we can empower ourselves to become these deities that we are working on in vajrayana. So these four stages, we could also call them, first off, having the imagination or the ability to have in your heart the center, this morality center. And then we could call it literally, we could call it uh, evoking, visualizing, and embodying. And it is that that we were aiming at when we took many of the beautiful poems that describe the relationship to the being of Sophia and put it in the first volume of Gospel of Sophia. So as you go into the temple of wisdom or the temple of Sophia, you are also working on morality issues, actually through the seven different pillars that are in that temple. There are seven different virtues, heavenly virtues that we develop, and there are seven other paths of perdition, the seven deadly sins. And so one of the first things that you have to realize when you're beginning to do your own self-initiation. And by the way, there are no true paths of initiation left anymore in the world, spiritual paths of traditional religions or mythologies. Rudolf Steiner said there's only two ways that you can have a full initiation in our world in this age right now. One of them is to become a Waldorf teacher and watch a child from first grade through seventh grade show you what the etheric body looks like. We talked a bit about that last in the last lecture. 
That is called the eternal curriculum. It's a curriculum derived from the ether body of the human being. And so once we know we have a physical body, this etheric body, we all know we have a body of desires, and that body changes whether you're awake or you're asleep. When you're in dreams, that desire, some of the desires still go all over the place in your dreams. And then above that, you have the controlling mechanism of your own I am, of your own ego, not egotistic, but your own I am, your own ego presence, your own individualized personality that goes from life to life, human life to life. That is found, of course, in the human heart. So the ego and the astral body, we use them when we're conscious. But if you go into meditation or you go into some spiritual state, a transcendental state, you can, through purifying that astral body until it becomes the virgin soul, the pure virgin heart, you can prepare yourself to separate your etheric body from your physical body. And when you do that, you now have access to your own etheric body. And the etheric body of the human being has written into it, just like our DNA, all of the past, the present, and the future. And that is what initiation is trying to unlock. Initiation or ascension is an attempt for the astral body to become controlled through these quests on the spiritual pathways. The quest is at first to tame the dragon in yourself. In other words, from the heart down are the lower forces that we should have already taken care of in the past. They're oftentimes seen with Kuan Yin as a dragon, that she is taming this dragon. And what does she tame the dragon with? With this vase that she holds below her heart. And if you look closely at the being uh, who represents Avalokiteshvara, the female version, who is also White Tara, who is Chinrezig, who has many, many names. But if you're looking at this being of compassion, you will see that when she is Kuan Yin, she has at her heart beautiful peach blossom colored drops. And it's inside of a square, a cube in fact, and inside of that cube are these drops. And Rudolf Steiner and many other clairvoyants will tell you that you can look into someone's heart and you can see if they're moral because you can literally see inside of that vase whether there are these peach blossom drops of immortality as they are called. But you can also look into someone's head and you can see if there is a residue that's left there by the development of consciousness that starts in the heart. And that's called brain sand. And between the two, we can see that ascension rises up from the heart and goes through these processes that I described before, a morality, mantra training, or singing, or using your words properly, visualization, visualizing yourself as something higher, because if you do, you will eventually become that. And then in the end, what is it that we're trying to actually have with the process of ascension? communication with higher beings. It could be yourself, your higher self, but it could also be all of the many different deities, all the many different saints and heroes, and basically the beings that are worshiped through all the traditional religions. They exist in some purified realm. It's described in many, realm, many ways, whether it's Shambhala or Tushi to heaven, or the realm of spiritual economy, which we spoke about before. Whenever a human being purifies and perfects anything, it's kept in this pure and absolute realm of the etheric because the earth has its own etheric body just like each individual has their etheric body. So if you could look into the etheric body, which we really can't in a conscious state, we would have to cross the threshold between the seen and the unseen world. We would have to cross the threshold between the physical and the spiritual world. But if we could do that, and we separated our etheric body from our physical body, we start a process of ascension. Now, that can be described in many, many different ways. And tonight you'll hear me refer to the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil again and again. And you're going to hear that I'm going to say that that living imagination cannot be found in the head. It can be found in the heart. It can be found in our metabolic limb system. It can be found in many different ways to come to our experience. 
Now, Rudolf Steiner describes the Holy Grail, as we have talked about before, in many different ways. He gives us dozens of examples of what the science of the Holy Grail is, what the Holy Grail is, and we can find places in our physical nature where we can see that. But I am not in any sense limiting the development of consciousness to what we have as our physical nature and or its chemistry and or anything that science would be able to analyze with the five senses. Most of these things, including bioelectric energy in the body, piezoelectric energy, these things are invisible. Warmth, light, sound, life, the four ethers, they're invisible. The ether that holds them together, the Akashic ether, it is only now coming to the consciousness of scientists to realize that there is an Akashic field that out of a vacuum comes infinite energy and that zero point physics is the direction that we need to go. But also, as I pointed out earlier in another talk, no matter what theory they have nowadays, it is going to refer to one of a few things, either gravitons, etherons, some type of ether, the luminiferous ether. In some way, almost every single theory of everything that I know of refers to the ethers in some fashion. And even Einstein had to defer to the luminiferous ether. And other scientists will tell us all about the ethers. And when it comes down to explaining anything, they will either say, oh, that's the ethers, that's in the ethereal realm, oh, that's, they'll make references to this mysterious ether realm. Just as we talked about in the second talk about the being of Anthroposophia, Anthroposophists will always, when it comes down to it, in the most difficult moments of trying to explain spirit, will defer to the being of Anthroposophia, this third person in the divine feminine trinity. Well, if you talk to Anthroposophists about ethers and the ether body and the etherization of the blood, they will simply drift away. They will not answer your questions. When I was young and even more brazen than I am now, I would try to teach the ethers to people and the anthroposophical teachers would get very upset with me and tell me that I'd gone way too far, that I'd revealed way too much. But here's the reality. None, none of the true lineage spiritual teachings about these topics, whether it be through Shivism, whether it be through Kali, Vajrayogini, whether it be through Chenrezig or Haruka or uh, Chakrasamvarya, it doesn't matter. They are all only activated by the female force. Without that, you cannot come to what is called the completion stage. So in all of these practices that I know of that are true practices, there's a generation practice where you generate morality, you generate good feelings, you generate sounds and images, and you try to become something more than you are. And in this process, you actually are led there by a being that we would call Anthroposophia, the being of wisdom. It has, that being has many names, Manjushri, uh, White Tara, very many, many different names in different traditions, but when you look in all of them, they all say the same thing. And they also say that as you generate this force, that's one stage. The more important stage is the completion stage. And so we put into the Gospel of Sophia the three stages. They're called the outer, the inner, and the secret teachings. The outer teachings gave you a complete cosmology in the first book, the inner teachings prepare you for understanding the mechanism that your body is going to go through when you wish to have self-initiation, when you wish to have ascension. And the third book is, in fact, building upon all traditions an initiation, but it is a self-initiation. So the third book of the Gospel of Sophia tells you how to reach to find your own language of the Spirit because that's what we're trying to do. When you ascend, even when Christ was trans, transfigured, what happened? Other spiritual beings came and dwelt and communicated with him. When we're talking about the Holy Grail and the Last Supper, or you're talking about seeking the Grail, these are all moving towards the same exact thing. The process of ascension 
is simply described in a thousand ways. Within the Catholic Church, it's described as Holy Communion. And you see the grail, and you see the wine, and you see the bread, and you see the water that they put in them, put into it. And people forget that you, they also add water. And then they hold it up at a certain point, just as the very same things of, that I just described, but in different terms, are rising up so that we can then have, what? Communion, which is what the Holy Eucharist is called, communion with divine spiritual beings. Communication, but how are we going to communicate with them when we cross that threshold between the physical and the spiritual unless you understand their language? So what we did is we went to all the traditional religions and we found something most amazing. That in the human body, there are certain characteristics that you can then say, well, isn't that quite amazing that in the brain, on one side of your cerebral cortex and on the other side, you have what looks like a tree if you took a cross section of it. Same thing happens with the uh, cerebellum. A cross section of it looks just like a tree with 11 limbs and a trunk. And so these 12 and 12 make 24, both in the cerebellum and in the cerebral cortex. Those are what we call phosphenes. They are a language. So the letter B, for instance, as Rudolf Steiner said, we have to go out and teach the children where to find the forces of the letter B, B, to find the forces of the letter L. And of course, Steiner gives us eurythmy gestures to go along with these, but he also tells us that we need to have the children paint these in the colors that will solicit the true experience of finding these phosphenes, these archetypal structures that are found out in nature and in our own brain. And this has now been found out to be true with all the brain research. They can actually create letters that you hear in your head, and then they put those letters together. And then eventually they found out that they could create a neural network that would explain a narrative to you with one image, but only if that image had to do with religion, morality, spirituality, transcendental experience. That is the thought that when it reaches the brain fills what we call the human part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the midbrain, which we call the mammalian brain, and the hindbrain, which is rudely called the reptilian brain, or we could call it the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. As we're looking at the brain and the head, we actually are given a great indication because where is it that we are ascending to? As I have said before, and Rudolf Steiner has said, and many of the great theosophists and thurgists and hermeticists have all said, that the individual, the microcosm, is an exact copy of the macrocosm. And that the principles that rule in the great also rule in the small, as the hermeticists call it, as above, so below. Well, the human head if we're going to talk about cosmology and explain the etherization of the blood, we must first describe some cosmological facts. One of them is that the human head is a picture of the whole cosmos, the starry cosmos. And it is almost completely round, except for the fact that it still has a limb to it, our jaw. And in it, what do we find? We find seven holes, the seven ethers, with five senses. And those five senses bring the whole sensory world into us through the head. Now in Tibetan Buddhism and in uh, Hindu philosophy, you'll see five Buddha families in a crown upon the head of anyone that is a budding bodhisattva or someone like Vajrayogini wears this crown. And what is that crown? That is the crown that is also referred to as Lucifer's crown. And this crown has in it a stone and the stone is called the wish-fulfilling stone, or it's called the Sintamani stone. And the being of Avalokiteshvara, who also has many other names, as I said, the being of compassion, holds this wish-fulfilling stone at his heart or her heart, and because this being is both male and female. And when the wish-fulfilling stone, the Sintamani, is at the heart, then that bodhisattva has the capacity to wish for anything and receive it. What does that sound like? Sounds very much like the Holy Grail. 
it sounds very much like what we've been hearing about the secrets of the heart. Now, there's an ancient Tibetan story, one of the most ancient Tibetan stories, is about a meteorite that fell from the sky. And that meteorite, when it was found, the king of Tibet received it, they gave it to the king of Tibet, and it was a cube, a cask, a casket. It was a chest. And in this chest, when it was opened, were four things. The bowl that became the Buddha's begging bowl that we always see at the Buddha's lower chakras, sitting usually in both hands. And if not the bowl there, it's usually a, a round ball. But you have the begging bowl of Buddha, which the stories say that it has all four of the ethers pulled into one bowl. There were four bowls and it was pulled into this one bowl. And then inside of this chest, this cask, the king of Tibet also found the wish-fulfilling stone. And on the wish-fulfilling stone, again, that fell from the sky as a meteorite, on this wish-fulfilling stone is the name of the new king of the grail, or the name of the king, the ruler. And what does it say on this stone? It says, Om Mani Padme Hum, hail thou jewel in the heart of the lotus. In other words, hail the I am in you. That's really what the stone of Lucifer, that's really what this wish-fulfilling stone and what this uh, Sintamani stone has as a message to all of us. It is the Holy Grail. It is the stone fell from Lucifer's crown. And it fell into a cask, this cube. We'll talk about that in a minute. The third thing found in this cask is a book of wisdom, oftentimes referred to as Prajnaparamita, or when you see one of these deities, they will have in their left hand, holding up their finger like this, a stem coming out to a flower called a patala flower, which represents wisdom. And so inside of this cask, you have your I am, you have the begging bowl of Buddha, and you have the wisdom teachings, and they're called tertons. But there's one other thing that until recently absolutely mystified me, and that is a little tiny stupa. And a stupa has on it a tetrahedron, kind of like a cone, a sphere, and a cube. Now you might say, what does that mean? Well, that stupa, there are eight stupas that Buddha created, and each one of them represents a different level of purification. And the stupa that is inside of this chest is basically stating that this is the teachings of Buddha. Now, when Buddha came to earth, this begging bowl was given to Buddha, the stone was lost. And so there was a great being called Avalokiteshvara who came to the earth. And Avalokiteshvara looked around and saw all the suffering and was completely devastated because Avalokiteshvara was a, was a bodhisattva, had taken the vow of the bodhicitta, that he, she would not go to heaven until all other beings would come along with Avalokiteshvara. So Avalokiteshvara heard about the wish-fulfilling stone and searched the world over for it. And the reason that Avalokiteshvara wanted the stone was so that he or she could help all those in suffering. Because in the time that Avalokiteshvara looked for the stone, he saw all the suffering of the world. And so they wanted a remedy. She wanted a remedy. This is the same being as a female being. So this Avalokiteshvara found the stone held it at her heart. And at that moment, because of the desire to help all those who are suffering, Avalokiteshvara's head split open and three ranks of three heads came on top and then two heads on top of that. That's the nine hierarchies. And out of that, the eyes that looked in all directions saw the suffering of all the beings and at that moment, Avalokiteshvara's arms sprouted into 10,000 arms. And in the palm of each hand of each of those arms was an eye or an ear, an, a, a, an organ to listen or to hear the suffering. And then from the spiritual world, from the etheric realm, 
every type of spiritual tool, whether it be a, a perba or a dorje or um, a, a taiguk or any of these spiritual tools, uh, which are also rosaries and the begging bowl of Buddha, all of these appeared in the hands of Avalokiteshvara to remedy the suffering of the 10,000 people. Now, this is an amazing story. And when I was being trained by a variety of different Tibetan Buddhists, I would always say to them, I don't understand this. You're telling us that you're clairvoyant, but I'm telling you that unless you see Jesus Christ in the etheric world, you're not clairvoyant. And they would all laugh at me and they'd say, oh, no, 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 no. We call that being Avalokiteshvara, Chinrezig. This is the being of, of uh, with all these different names, including they believe that the Dalai Lama actually embodies that being of compassion through the being Chinrezig when the Dalai Lama is incarnated. So he becomes the tolku of this being, kind of like um, a being who might represent wisdom. For instance, there's a being in Tibetan Buddhism called Jetsun Kushala, and she represents Vajrayogini, the being of wisdom. So what we have here that these secret teachings are only given out through certain practices and lineages that they will admit to you are no longer valid. I have been fortunate enough to receive many of those initiations in a variety of, of religions and traditions. Uh, and basically, they're all teaching the same thing. And essentially, this is what they're teaching. They're teaching that when the morality of your heart is strong enough, a separate type of event happens. But first, let me describe this. The head being more perfect than the heart, because it's the past and the heart is the present, and your metabolic limb system is the future, because it's more perfect, you already see this threefold division of the human being right in the head. You see it in the thinking in the forebrain, the feeling in the midbrain, and the willing in the hindbrain. And Rudolf Steiner said that all of this wisdom of the animals is right there in that hindbrain. And what is it that we're doing? When we hear of these teachings of Kundalini Yoga. Now there's Hatha Yoga, there's, there's uh, Agni Yoga, there's Raja Yoga, there's Kundalini Yoga, and there's higher yogas. So to think that Kundalini is the highest yoga is a mistake. What it really is, is an ancient teaching that has been misinterpreted in our times. And I have studied with people who have initiated me in the ancient practices of raising the Kundalini. It is extraordinarily dangerous. And it is that spear that we talked about that holds the dragon down. It's that sword that must hold the forces of your animal desires at bay. And if you wish to awaken that from the very base of your spine, where there is, in fact, another cube, you will, unfortunately, depending upon whether you're male or female, depending on which side you start, there are two streams that go up called Ida, Pingala, and Shishumna. Shishumna is the middle stream. So the Ida and Pingala are the male and the female. Now, Rudolf Steiner tells us that's silica and calcium. The alchemists call that the red blood of the lion and the white gluten of the eagle. And when you mix them together, you have the ability, once you add morality, to have the possibility of depositing something that is a direct communication and a response from the spiritual world when you raise things up through your own normal spinal column, coming in through the seven chakras, of course, as we know. And as it goes up, if there's something there that is of substance, whether in your thinking, feeling, or willing, that is of a higher nature, whether it's imagination, inspiration, or intuition, the three higher forms of thinking, feeling, and willing, that becomes food for the gods and the goddesses. And as you do what is called earthly nutrition, through the etherization of the blood, you get the possibility for cosmic nutrition to answer. And when that happens, this process that we have the scientists referring to as biomineralization 
causes a spark through the piezoelectric activity of calcium carbonate in the pineal gland to from the fourth ventricle to jump across the third ventricle all the way to stimulate the pituitary gland, at which point the pituitary gland excretes pituitrin. Well, pituitrin is the hormone, a growth hormone, hormone that stimulates the blood and the nerve. In other words, the blood, the she, silica, and the nerve, calcium. The male and the female in the human body, the bread and the wine. But the trick to the whole thing is look closely in all of these acts, these spiritual acts that replicate what Christ said was the thing they were supposed to continue to do over and over in His name. There's water added to the wine. What is that water? We pointed out before that it is the water of the gods. It's the blood of the gods. Now, since everything in the universe is found in the human body, where do we find that in the human body? That is cerebral spinal fluid. Because in the head, the brain is resting upon the cerebral spinal fluid and it takes the weight of the brain off of being pressed upon the bone. Without that, your brain would not be the island that it is. In fact, it is somewhat of a replica of the Garden of Eden. And the reason I say this is because if you look very closely, you will find that at the base of the cerebellum, Rudolf Steiner says that the choroid plexus filters the blood into cerebral spinal fluid. It filters it into what we would call plasma, but it's enriched with all kinds of metals and minerals. And that then feeds the brain. So there's the brain-blood barrier. But that barrier does not take into account, it, it does not include the pineal gland and what the pineal gland sits on top of. And Rudolf Steiner said it is right there at the pineal gland sitting on top of the corpora quadra gemini that we can see the grail castle. And that the grail king who was wounded is the pineal gland lying down. Now what they've now realized is that when there is a, they can't understand what type of stimulation, but there's a stimulation of the pineal gland, it rises up, it stands up. And when it does, it opens up the sylvius aqueduct and the fourth ventricle flows that water, what we could call the rivers of life or the rivers coming out of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, we could say, that this water flows in and it flows into and past the pineal gland, which now becomes the gatekeeper and opens it. When it flows into the third ventricle, the first and the second ventricle also release these things called corpora arenacea. They're called brain sand. There are other names for it, but we'll refer to it as brain sand. It is calcium carbonate. Now, when that is released, both from the first and second ventricles into the third ventricle in the midbrain, they are piezoelectric metallic particles also excreted from the choroid, uh, choroid plexus in the third ventricle and the fourth. So all four ventricles release the cerebral spinal fluid, but the stuff that is enriched with metals and minerals. And then the piezoelectric energy that is found in calcium carbonate can cause a spark to go across that, at which point the pituitary is so stimulated that it excretes this growth hormone, pituitrin. Now the ancients would say if you put your tongue in the top of your mouth, you can actually taste it. It's called the dew of heaven, it's called soma, it's called amrita, it's called ambrosia nectar. There are a thousand names for it. But it all describes a natural process that happens with moral people. Now, moral people that this process is happening in, you can see in the ancient past described as saints with halos. In the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism, they would say that you become a rainbow warrior and that this arc coming across from the pineal to the pituitary stimulates a rainbow coming out of your third eye. And that's the reason, one of the reasons they put a dot there as a representation that the two petals of the brow chakra are merged into one. Well, this process is now being studied. They do not understand it. But one thing's for sure, 
It produces more energy than they ever imagined before. So the idea that bioenergy is created by calcium, potassium, and sodium simply through our nerves is not true. The idea that it's also possibly created in the bloodstream through what's called the, in the, uh, in the atrium, it's called the atriosinus node, where in fact they say just the streams of carbon dioxide and the metals and minerals in the blood streaming across this one point that's no bigger than, the, than your thumb, actually your fingernail on your thumb, Little tiny point, that's exactly how big it is. There's another one in the ventricle uh, on the right side of the heart, and they work together, but it's really just from this one point. The ancients called that the tongue of flame where your I am exists. Now, this chest, the chest is an analogy. It is found in human consciousness in the following way. When we know ourselves, we know ourselves as someone who can be, can go forward or backward, up or down, left or right. What is that when you have those six things together? It's a cube. And all of the sacred teachings state that there's a cube in the heart. And this cube in the heart can grow as big as the cosmos or as so tiny that you can, can't see it. And no matter how hard you try, if you dive your consciousness down from your brain into your heart, it's going to hit this hard rock of a cube and it will rebound and it cannot break into it. Well, it is also, when we look at it, what is left, right? That's what I just described as the silica calcium poles of female and male. What is up and down? That's the ascension and descension we talked about. And in the middle is the heart. What is forward and backward? That's the chakras. People don't understand that your chakra energy comes in from behind and moves forward. But sense impressions come from outside and move inward. And so you have left, right, up, down, forward, and backward inscribed in the heart. And it is there that you have the inviolable home of the I am. You have the Sintamani. You have the redeemed stone of Lucifer. You have the Holy Grail. You have the chalice or excuse me, the bowl of Solomon that was used at the Last Supper. But those are analogies. In your heart, do you really have that? Well, yes, you do. But first, let me describe something else. The Tibetan Buddhists and the highest levels of Vajrayana Tantrayana teaching says the same thing that Rudolf Steiner says. Anywhere below the heart, that's the past. You were supposed to have worked that out before. Your sex desires, your food desires, your pleasure desires, all of the seven deadly sins are there in your lower chakras. And if you haven't worked them out, then you need to work on that now before you try to start your own self-initiation or it won't work. Well, they say that if you take all those chakras below the heart, they become one chakra and they turn out and they have one lotus flower and it has 64 petals in it. But strangely enough, it doesn't point outward, it points upward. And as we know, the crown chakra points upward also. Well, this is what is called the fierce woman in many, many practices, or the face, retention, breath. All of the ancient teachings were based upon the breath. It is inappropriate for us to use those breath exercises in today's world. They are extraordinarily dangerous. They can light up all your chakras, yes. But if you don't know what to do with that energy afterwards, you can, as I have seen in many people, take many, many years to try to understand what happened to you because you did not receive the proper training to begin with. So the bowl of the Buddha that's found in the chest, that is the chakra, the lower chakras, turned up like a bowl. And when you do a breath exercise called the vase retention breath, and you take your breath in, as Rudolf Steiner points out, in every breath is the possibility, and quite often, that you have extra carbon dioxide that is not utilized. If you take that and you put it in the bowl, you put the lid on it, and you do a certain breath exercise, what happens is you cook it. You take oxygen, carbon dioxide, and silica and calcium. And you put it in, basically, to that vase until you cook it. And when it's hot enough, it starts to rise up 
And this is what is called the etherization of the blood. It is the ionization of particles that relate to the different chakras. Now, in the heart, as we know, the heart works with respiration. It's the seat of oxygen, but it's also the seat of carbon dioxide. And so when we can take carbon dioxide, which has O2 in it, which has a great deal of levity in it, and, and as it starts to move up the chakras, we can then take the silica and the calcium, the male and the female, we can merge them together through ionization with oxygen and with carbon dioxide until we then add at the throat chakra, nitrogen, the brow chakra, hydrogen, and also from the adrenal glands and from the crown chakra, phosphorus and sulfur. And in the end process, we take what is normally the death giving elements of calcium. As a matter of fact, you die because cal generally from old age because of calcification, uh, basically. And when you are born, especially in utero, even before you're born, you're well over 90% silica. Neither one of those can we digest. But without them, our blood system and our nerve system will not work. But when you can merge them together and you can add these other elements, which are truly a process of spiritual nourishment, which reflect earthly nourishment, which I'll talk about in just a second, you can transform calcium into a crystal that is piezoelectric. Now, unfortunately, you can also center your life in the head. And in the pineal gland, instead of depositing calcium carbonate crystals, which is in the shape of a cube, and by the way, the pineal is sitting on top of a cube divided into eight cubes, which is an amazing thing. And then the cube in the heart and the cube where you start the kundalini at the base of your spine. Now you're beginning to see that there's these different cubes. And what did the stupa have as its basis? A cube. What are the other three parts of the stupa found in the chest? A ball. Well, that's what calcite turns into. It turns into these beautiful little roses that are hex hexagonal, but they kind of look like a ball. And what does fo uh, calcium phosphate turn into? It turns into a tetrahedron, the exact shape on top, or either a cone. It looks like a cone or a tetrahedron, the same shape on top of a stupa. So in the pineal gland, we have what supposedly fell from the sky along with Buddha's bowl, along with the wish-fulfilling stone, along with the book of wisdom, the exact picture of the crystallization process of the human pineal gland in relationship to thinking, feeling, and willing. Because if you start from the heart, you can change the calcium into calcium carbonate, which is piezoelectric, which then starts the whole process of the cosmic nutrition, because what we're describing now is earthly nutrition, rising up, getting ready to receive the cosmic nutrition. And when people go too far into their thinking as materialists and only believe in the five senses and what's in the physical world, you create too much phos uh, calcium phosphate, which is not good for you. Or you create calcite, which in fact is harmful to you. Now, once this process happens, through the crown chakra, the spiritual world basically feeds us as a response to what it is that we have fed them, and now we are in a symbiotic relationship of transcendental spiritual communion. And the language that I'm teaching you now is one language that you can use to meditate on these things to get there. But you can also just take the 22 phrases from Jesus Christ, the 22 teachings of Shinra Miwa. Uh, uh, Tampa Mioche, or you can take the teachings of Buddha, or you can take all of these different languages of the spirit that we provided for you. And once you have that, and you understand the things we're describing here, and you have a cosmology, and you have the morality development, then you have the possibility for the spiritual world to respond to you with cosmic nutrition. And as I pointed out, this cosmic nutrition feeds the very systems that you started with, the blood and the nerve system the she and the he. And what are these two 
Snakes, but the, they're not really snakes, they're called channels. What are these? These are in fact where the nerve ganglia and the seven chakras feed into the spine that takes it up to the brain and every breath you take, every heartbeat causes a rhythmic sounding in the third ventricle of the brain. And there in the gap called the interthalamic adhesion, we can see that the flow of cerebral spinal fluid causes what is what we scientists calls a magnetohydrodynamic generation of direct current. So that is where the bioenergy of the brain comes from. But as you will hear if you study the heart math material or any science that has looked at this, the heart is much stronger with its bioenergetic field, bioelectric field than the brain, some say a thousand times more. Well, how does that happen? Well, that happens because the second part of the nutrition is called the vagus nerve. There are 12 nerves that go into the corpus quadrigemini, that little cube, that then that nerve feeds the pineal gland, and the pineal gland can then rise up based upon neurological impulses from the 12 nerves. But to feed your own heart, to deposit the peach blossom drops of eternity, eternal drops. It is a stimulation of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is very mysterious and the more they study it, the more they find that it goes all the way down into your metabolic system. In other words, this chakra of the Buddha's bowl. And it goes up through the heart and where does it go through? That very node I just described, the sinus node. And what does it do on the way up to the brain? Particularly entering in through uh, the corpus uh, corpora quadrigemini, it informs what we normally think as the spinal cord with what we are giving out to the world. Instead of just receiving our senses in, the frontal spinal column, as Rudolf Steiner called it, the vagus nerve, is actually our spiritual response to the world. And that can only come once we've digested the world, made our offerings to the spiritual world. The spiritual world has responded with its communion through this language of the spirit, through this blessing of the pituitary and through the pituitary gland. Again, these are mechanisms. This is not the spirit itself. And then the human body is completely nourished by this. So these processes that the ancient clairvoyants saw, Rudolf Steiner has now elaborated on even more. And what we have done with the second volume of the Gospel of Sophia is try to give you a picture that you can meditate on, because when you can meditate on these things, you can enhance them. And do not be limited, but if you're a materialist, this may be the only way that you can understand these things. And then when you have these experiences, then it can open you up to the fact that there is an unseen world, that there are spiritual beings that can help us. So through earthly nutrition, which Rudolf Steiner said, can be directly drawn from your breath, he says that the elements of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus is what we extract from our food. Not actually we extract it, but we build on it. Those are the very same elements that are part of the etherization of the blood. And when we look at the halo of the saint, we just need look at the halo of the earth, both with the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. When ionized particles of what? Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen rise up and meets the breath of the sun, the solar Christ breath of the sun. What do we see? We see a halo about the head of the earth. Same thing happens with the saint. So as we are describing these processes to you, this is the goal that we were trying to move towards, to understand with the cosmology, to understand the feminine nature that would help you in this process, to understand the ethers, to understand the quest, to understand that all of the quests that we've described are moving towards spiritual pathways. And these spiritual pathways are found directly in your human body. You start with the grail in the head. You penetrate your heart and you open it up until it bleeds blood that can be ionized through this fierce fire coming from below. And when that can rise up, you are offering food to the gods and goddesses. And you can be assured 
that they will respond appropriately.